In this video, we're going to investigate the temperature in a reactor. Basically, what we want to do is to give you an example of how to use PDEs to solve a problem of interest. So, what we're going to do is to derive a very simplified uh, version of the heat equation and explain to you how we do it using PDEs. So, let me consider this reactor and uh, mathematically speaking, it will be a domain omega with a boundary d omega, which I will assume to be perfectly regular with no problem in terms of regularity for this, uh, for this domain. Now, uh, what I'm looking for here is the temperature inside of this reactor at each point and each time. So, the unknown will be theta of Tx Theta will be the unknown, will be the solution I'm looking for. And the two variables of interest uh, are T, the time, and X, the location in the reactor. And again, what I would like to know is what is theta of Tx. Now, there will be several parameters that will play a role here. The first is the density, the density of the fluid. Uh, the density of the fluid tells you how many kilograms of matter you have in a cubic uh, meter. So, that is rho. Uh, that we can consider, uh, obviously rho might depend, on, might depend on x and t. We might consider it uh, as a constant just to simplify things, but you will see when we derive the equation uh, how things work. The other parameter is the velocity of the fluid. That will be u. Then we will have f which is the source of heat. Inside the reactor, we will have heat coming in. So, that will be the source uh, that will have to, to, obviously will play a very important role in the equation. So, that is F. Now, there are two parameters of interest as well. The first one is CV, and that is the specific heat capacity. And that parameter tells you um, how much energy you need to put in for a kilogram of matter to increase its temperature by one Kelvin, or one degree Celsius, if you prefer. So, if I have one kilogram of something, and I want this to go up one degree Celsius, uh, how much energy, how, much, how, many, how many joules then, then do, I need, do I need to put in so that that, 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 that body of, 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 of matter goes up one degree? Okay, that is the specific heat capacity. Obviously, this number will change depending on what kind of matter you have. If you have, if you have water, it will be different than if you have copper, and it will be different if you have something else. So, obviously, that is one parameter that will play a role in our equation. The other parameter that will play a role in the equation is the thermal conductivity. And let me actually give you an example here by doing a small experiment. And you can do the same experiment at home, actually. There is nothing dangerous in it. So, here is what you can do. You can take a, uh, basically, a vase of water, uh, which has been sitting here for a long time, by the way. So, this, this, uh, this vase of water, uh, here it is. It has been sitting here for a very long time. And I'm going to put my hand in it. And you know what? It's cold. Now, why is it cold? Uh, really, that's, that's, a, that's a good question, right? Why is it cold? It has been, this has been here for a long time, and the second law of thermodynamics tells me that, uh, well, basically, everything is, should be at the, at the equilibrium. So, there is no reason for this to be cold. Uh, so, why is it cold? Well, the answer is, it's not. I mean, it's not, it's not colder than the air. Uh, it's not. So, if it's not colder than the air, then why do I feel it's colder? I mean, really, it was cold. I mean, of course, you can't do the experiment through the, through the video, but you can, you can try this at home. So, why is it cold? Dur. And, as I said, it's not. And if I was to actually use a thermometer here, I would see that it is not colder at all. The reason is, the joules in my hand were going faster out of my hand, because the thermal conductivity was actually higher. So, what happened is that the number of watts per uh, meter per Kelvin 
was higher in water than it is in the air. And that is the thermal conductivity. And what, what we have here is obviously uh, the water and the air are at the very same temperature, but when you actually put your, 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 your hand in water, uh, then your, 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 the, 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 the energy of your body, the joules of your body, of your hand in this case, will actually uh, leave your body faster. And then you feel what you feel when you feel something is cold. What you actually feel is that the joules are coming out and you need to replenish uh, with joules so your body stays at 37 degrees Celsius. So that's exactly what happened. So what, what we're saying here is that there is a, uh, a parameter of interest which is the thermal conductivity. And just for your information, in air, uh, it is about 0 0.026 watt per meter per Kelvin, while in water, it was 0 0.6 or 609. So obviously about 20 to 25 times more. And this is why we have this situation. All right. Okay, so now we have these two parameters and we are able to say that we are uh, going to derive this heat equation and I'm going to explain to you how we're going to, to derive this heat equation where we have rho CV time derivative of theta plus divergence uh, of uh, rho CV theta u minus divergence of kappa uh, del theta equals f. Now, I put an x for divergence and, 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 and del just to uh, point out, just to emphasize that we're just taking derivatives with respect to the x variable, not with respect to t. Okay? Um, now, if the fluid doesn't move, and we're going to make this hypothesis to simplify things a bit, then u will be zero, um, and therefore, well, the, the divergence term will just vanish. Okay? So what we're going to do now is to establish the heat equation when the fluid does not move. We're going to establish this equation here. So let's do it. All right. So we're going to write energy conservation. And energy conservation, uh, first we're going to talk about the density of the energy in a little volume V. Uh, for, ju ju just consider a... a, a piece of volume here, it's going to be any volume, really, it's just small, uh, and then you have, uh, well, this volume, and the, qu the question is, how much density of energy do you have in this volume? Well, we, we have talked about the specific heat capacity, that tells you how many joules you have per kilogram of matter per Kelvin, right? So, uh, if you have a volume, then first rho is going to tell you how much kilograms uh, how much matter you have in this volume. So I'm first going to consider rho and just multiply it by CV and then by the temperature. And that exactly gives me an amount of joule, which is the density of energy in V. So that is the first thing. Now, now that I have the, the density of energy in this volume, if I want to, to have the energy in the volume, I just integrate the density over the volume. And I'm going to I'm putting three integrals here because usually a lot of physicists do that. Uh, actually, like we could just put one, but it's just, just to be, you know, j just out of nice gestures to the, phys to the physicists, we just put three integral signs. And obviously only one is needed. Okay, um, now the, on, the, the other thing is that what is the energy going in and out of this volume? Well, I will call this the energy flux and I will denote it Q. And later, obviously, we're going to have to come back to this, uh, to this flux to, to see how it relates to the rest of the equation. Then we have the sources and possibly sinks in V. And we said that uh, this will be modeled by a function f. So if we have joules coming in, um, then that will be uh, in, in f. Or if we have joules coming out, that will be f. So that's the sources or sinks of energy in V. All right, now that we have all of this, what we can say is the variation of energy in V, and that will be the derivative of that, uh, of the energy in V, so that's d over dt uh, d of, 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 the, of the energy uh, in V, which we, we just wrote here, uh, earlier, that will be uh, whatever is coming out, uh, so that's uh, minus uh, the integral over the boundary of the flux, plus the integral of uh, the energy sources in V, that's the integral of F. So here's what we have. 
Uh, so here is the equation that we, we, we have. Now, you can look at the regularity of the, of the, of, of, of the, of the functions and actually assume you have enough regularity uh, to get the derivative in the uh, integral. And so what you get is the integral over the volume of the derivative with respect to time of uh, rho cv theta tx. At this point, I did not even consider rho to be a constant, so that's why it is inside the, the derivative. All right, and we didn't change anything on the right-hand side. Now, if you look at what you have here, you have uh, the Green's formula that tells you that if you have w uh, scalar product with the normal, then that is actually, and, and you integrate this over the, over, the, over, the, 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 over, the, over the boundary, then what you really get is the integral of the divergence, right? So let me replace uh, the, the term here to the right-hand side, the first term, this minus uh, integral over the, the, over the surface of QTS and S by the integral of its divergence over the volume. And so that, that's what I get, okay? All right. Now, this is true for all V. So if it's true for all V, the only possibility is that actually, when you put you know, everything on, the, on one side, is that the, 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 for all T and for all X, then the rho uh, CV of X, time derivative of, 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 uh, of uh, theta, plus the divergence of Q is equal to F. Now I've supposed that rho is uh, independent uh, of time, and so is the same same thing for for, for CV. J just just to simplify again, I mean we could we could obviously d do things differently. All right, so uh, we, we we have this equation. All right, so let's write this equation here. It's almost a PDE, but not yet, not completely, because we still have two unknowns, theta and Q. Now, it would be possible that we have some unknowns coming from outside, and that is called coupled PDEs. I mean, we have several PDEs, a system of PDEs, and uh, several, uh, several unknowns that are coupled. That, that, that happens all the time. But here, what we have is the Fourier law, which tells me that Q is minus kappa gradient of theta. So that will allow me to replace this Q term by something that only depends on theta and kappa. And, and, and what, what it really means is that the flux of energy will be a proportional to the gradient of the temperature. And you see this, uh, this proportionality coefficient is really uh, what we're talking about earlier when I was putting my hand in water, that is the thermal conductivity. So if you have a higher thermal conductivity, then the flux of joules will actually be higher than if you have a smaller thermal conductivity, which is why, again, when you plunge your, water, your, your hand in water, you feel it is colder, even though the water was at the very same temperature as the rest of everything else in this room. All right, so here is our equation. Rho CV time derivative of theta minus divergence of kappa gradient uh, theta equals F. All right, now we're not completely done because we have a PDE, but we still need to look at the initial condition. Uh, the initial condition is basically what you will observe at uh, when you start the reactor. Okay, or when you start the experiment at a given time, you have a theta zero. And obviously, as you would expect, things will, dip, th 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 things will not be the same if you start with a reactor which is already hot or uh, with a reactor which is cold. So, of course, I mean, theta at T and X will depend on this initial condition. It makes perfectly good sense. The other thing that it will depend on is what happens on the boundary of your reactor. Uh, you can have a prescribed value, uh, and that would be a Dirichlet boundary condition. You could have a flow, and that would be a Neumann uh, boundary condition. Or you could have a mix of both, where you have on part of the boundary Dirichlet and part of the boundary Neumann. Uh, that is uh, very possible, and that, in terms of modeling, is something you could certainly do. So here we are. We basically derive a PDE with its uh, initial condition and its boundary condition. 
Now, before we actually uh, call it a day, we just need to uh, do what we did in chapter one, which is to non-dimensionalize this equation. As you know, uh, when we actually run equations in mathematics, we don't have units. Uh, they're obviously very useful when we derive the equation, but before we actually um, work with the equation, we non-dimensionalize the equation. And again, we already did that in chapter one for an ODE, and of course we do it uh, pretty much the same way for a PDE. So we have the time and we're going to non-dimensionalize it. We have the length, we have the temperature, we have the velocity, uh, which in this case was, was not considered. We have the, um, uh, the thermal conductivity and we have the source uh, that is also taking, uh, taking place and, and we also have the specific heat capacity. All right, so once we do this, we basically uh, have a relationship between the, the variables and the variables with stars, uh, as we did in chapter one, and the equation we derive is the one which is right here, where obviously we have characteristic times, which are Tc is, is equal to L over U, Td, which is this, uh, this fraction, and Ts, which is that fraction, so we can just write things with this with these characteristic times, and then we actually have what we basically can call the heat equation. So here is for the derivation of the heat equation. But before we actually finish uh, this uh, video, I would like to show you that depending on Tc, Td, Ts, and, 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 and T, we might have different behaviors. Uh, so here's the situation. Again, the, the equation is dt theta plus something we did not derive in our example, we just considered what was zero, but again, uh, in, in the full derivation, uh, we would have this term t over tc divergent theta u minus t over td Laplace theta equals t over ts f. Now, we can have several behaviors. The first behavior possible is if t is really small compared to td, and Tc. In other words, uh, T over Tc and T over Td will be really close to zero, uh, and then we expect, of course we did not prove that we have any types of uh, well posedness uh, and of uh, continuity with respect to the parameters, so what I'm saying is what we expect is n n n by no mean a proof, but we expect that if this term is, is, if this T over Tc is close to zero and T over Td is close to zero, then uh, the, the PDE will somehow behave like dt theta equals f, which is an ODE. And actually it's an ODE we already discussed in chapter one. Uh, the other possibility is if we have t uh, greater than tc, uh, much greater than tc, which is also much greater than td, in this case, when you actually just look at what is close to zero, you just see that uh, what really remains is minus Laplace operator uh, equals f. And that is uh, called the diffusion equation in steady case. Steady, because obviously that is not depending on time. Somehow what we're saying is t is really large, so somehow the system has reached an equilibrium, and now we're just looking at what is this equilibrium. This is why we have a steady state equation. Time, t, is not playing a role in this. Then we could say, okay, what if t is about the same as td, and that's really small compared to tc? Well, in this case, what you end up with is uh, a parabolic equation, which is the time derivative of theta minus the, um, the, 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 the Laplace operator theta equals f. That is diffusion time dependent. So you see, this one is parabolic, while the one before was actually elliptic. That's interesting, isn't it? All right. Uh, what happens if we have t which is close to tc uh, and very small with respect to td? That would be, uh, that will leave us with the first two terms and that would be a transport equation. And finally, td, t, and tc that are about the, the, the same uh, value and then in this case would have a transport diffusion time dependent equation, basically the full equation which is right here.